Thank you so much for joining me on Ethocast. I'm Eddie Francis, and joining me is my good brother, Dr. Jason Merriweather. He is a speaker. He's the vice president of enrollment management at Campbellsville University. He's also an author, the author of Dismantling, Hazing, and Greek Letter Organizations, Effective Practices for Prevention, Response, and Campus Engagement. Jason, how you doing, man? Uh, see, I had the book ready for that moment. Right there, I had the book ready for that moment. I'm so glad to be here with you, good brother Francis. Um, thank you for the work you're doing. I've been watching you for a while. Um, you've done everything from Shine Life on the MPAC community and the Greek life community at large. And you've also shined so much light on HBCUs. And, uh, you know, I spent 10 years at FIST, so a lot of HBCU love there. So thank you for the work you're doing, brother. I'm glad to be on with you. And A506. A506. Check is in the mail, Fred. All right. So um, Hazing Prevention Week, man. Hazing Prevention Week, a big week every single year. Not in just the Greek community, but when it comes to university community and the high school community as well. Um from a 30,000 foot view, you're someone who talks about hazing all the time. You are very busy during hazing prevention week. Um, what do you see right now as far as the state of hazing incidents? And let's keep it within the Greek community. What What are you seeing right now from a 30,000 foot view? Well, unfortunately, there's so much to go around in the, in the, the Greek letter organization community that we can spend plenty of time later talking about outside because there's far too much happening in the community. So if you think about it this way, I keep my Google settings pretty much every way from Genesis to Revelation to capture anything that happens about hazing at a high school and athletics and of course in FSL. If I get four in a day, you know, one may be outside of FSL or two may be outside of FSL, but literally every day, 365 days a year, I don't even think Christmas is taken off that I don't receive something regarding hazing in a Greek letter organization. And that is really disturbing. It's really frightening. But if you look at a lot of the, the names and the faces that are out there, you're seeing these lawsuits go on now. You're seeing more and more criminal charges. Uh, you're seeing families take such a strong voice in what has happened to their loved ones. Right now, even if you look at the fact that I, I think it's A&E is doing a special on the, the horrific injuries to Danny Santulli. Uh, you see Timothy Piazza's name. You know, I can go to a university and, you know, and I'm good, good friends with Jim and Evelyn, uh, Tim's parents. Uh, God bless both of them for the work that they're doing. But I can put Tim's face up now and it's known and thank the family for that. You know, I mm -hmm. can uh, put Stone False's face up. And again, uh, shout out to Corey and Sherry, his parents and DJ, who is my my absolute dear friend and sister, his, his aunt. And, you know, the families have done so much work then now you know the, the, the faces of the people who've been harmed. You know, if, if you look, if, if I put Max Groover's face up, people see and know that they know Colin Wynn, you know, they know George DeSendis. And, and, and I'm saying that to say that, that that is what's changing, is that there's more of a face versus just a passing of the news cycle. But at the same time, concurrently, in the FSL community, what can also happen, Frat, is that in that same news cycle, as it passes, we can also forget because there are many names and faces that are not seen and not always out there. You know, I, I, I had a chance to sit with Leanne Koliak, 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 excuse me, with Leanne Koliak at the Hazing Prevention Summit in Indianapolis last year and talk with her. And, you know, it's just really amazing to me seeing her on campus and doing the work that she's doing and to keep that that conversation alive. So I do think that, that the role of the families, and, and, and again, I hate all the fact that they've gone through these tragedies and, and had these unnecessarily losses or these this unnecessary violence, and to have those things happen but at the same time, you're seeing the families who are getting out there who are making us remember what has happened. 
um, to these young people. And so if you think about what's going on sort of from that context, and, and again, and get, forgive me, let me make sure I call Harrison Kowiak's name too. I mentioned his mom. But is, is we, we look at what's happening right now. There's more conversation that there's ever been than there's ever been about what's wrong. But concurrently, the hidden harms are deeper and deeper and deeper than ever. And that's what's frightening right now is that it just seems that people go deeper. There's also this perception that, oh, MPHC is, is this violent, vicious hazing. Uh, they're, they're doing all this violent, vicious stuff. And we've had deaths, uh, you know, and, and, and it's it's really crazy what we've had in NPAC. But if you look at the abundance of what's happening right now, particularly in IFC, well, there's this perception of drinking, boys will be boys. Um, and right now, I, I'm most worried about the court system. And I mentioned DJ Williams earlier. I was on her podcast and we talked about the 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 people who perpetrated the hazing acts that led to Stone Falls' death at Bowling Green State. If you look at what happened with them, Frat, you know, 21 days, 14 days, 18 days in jail, suspended sentences. And you and, and understand that wouldn't have happened without the Fultz family fighting and showing up every day in state legislation, calling the governor, working with the president at Bowling Green State. It, it wouldn't have happened if they didn't show up to court every day. However, that's still not enough. If the courts can look at that family and still say, well, someone is dead, but I'm like, because my thing is this, if you rob a bank and you kill a teller while you're trying to get out of the bank, well, you're likely going to get a life sentence in prison if the court system does its job. But hazing death is still not, I believe, seen by the courts is, is problematic. So I think that has to happen. And so people are still dying. There's still tremendous risk. And I think that, that we have to get past this notion of, oh, boys will be boys, because we are seeing more people charged than ever. The sentences aren't quite as strong as they should be. But we are seeing more attention and more of a spotlight. And I think that's in large thanks to the families, because if the universities could get it right, we would have. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the universities, you encourage Greeks, you encourage advisors and university administrator, administrators to adopt preventative approaches to anti-hazing education and policies. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Wow. Glad to have this conversation. OK, now you're going to make me nerd out. So, OK, it, I, I think that we have to have early and honest conversations. Preventative is a big scholarly word and it looks pretty, but let's break it down a little bit. One of the things I've been telling universities for years is an orientation. We need to talk about hazing at orientation. Yes, we want people to pay their bill and register for classes. That's right. We want people to get their FAFSA so we can pull the money down and draw it down and put it on their bill and give them the refund check. We want them to know where to buy books. We want them to know where their res hall is, where they're going to be sleeping. That's important. However, it's a great time to talk about hazing yeah. and to talk about the risk in FSL and beyond. Why do we do that? Well, you've got parents here and you've got a captive audience. Institutions are often afraid to do that. Yeah, you may have fun. You may have the bounce house and all that. But we've got to have those conversations early. Let's be real about why. Your SGA president, your orientation leaders, your tour guides and admissions are often dual members and have intersections with FSL. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was an undergrad, obviously in the frat, I was an RA. I was a senator for student government, I think for a, a year or so. I think I did that. Um, did I do that? Yeah, I think I did that. I did something with student government or another. I don't know. I know I didn't, I didn't win. I didn't win one SGA election. It was like heartbreaking, but I think I, I did get to be a senator. I know oh, I I say that. It seems like that sticks with you. Okay. Yeah, it does. It does. You <laughs> see the trauma? I mean, you, I'll give you a copay later. I have <laughs> for the therapy and the catharsis. But seriously, seriously, I, I was uh, a tour guide. I worked in the orientation office. I was an RA. Uh, I was involved in, in intramurals. I did all this stuff. And if you're playing, you know, if you're playing ultimate Frisbee and I had a heck of a throw in ultimate Frisbee, if you're doing that and you've got on your frat shirt 
and you're at the table doing the tabling and you're, you maybe they say, oh, you can't wear your letters or you're going to slip on the pen. You're still going to talk about it. So we're working you early. The Greeks are working these kids early. And while it, it, there are different stages where some organizations you can join as a freshman, some not, you're seeing more and more universities say, well, you got to wait a semester. You can't join in the fall. You got to wait till spring to rush or do intake, right? Well, if we're in there and we're talking to you and we're already working you to say that, you know, it's okay. I know people are going to say this and that. And we don't talk about hazing till hazing prevention week at the end of September. And these students have had you since July to work you. It, we've lost. Yeah, and the and they're, and they're already getting involved in rush, and they're mm. already and from outside of FSL, you already have the ones who've gone through band training or band camps. You have the athletes who've been in camps, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, all of the above. So institutions have to do that early. I think the other the place for me in preventive education is really in the the peer intervention conversation. And so in I think the blue book, the Greek University book, my chapter is on ta -da, it's on peer education and intervention, a viable tool to present hazing. We use that conversation, and it's also in this book as well. We use that conversation to frame what what it looks like to actually teach the students how to check themselves because that's where, where, where the real work is. So if we go back to Alan Berkowitz in the early 2000s, he, he created a really strong model to combat sexual assault in frat houses where essentially you would say, you, you see someone trying to slip someone in someone's drink. Yo, we don't do that in this house. What are you doing? Like, stop. We're not doing that. You see someone trying to get a, a, a young lady that's intoxicated behind the frat house or, or upstairs. No, nah, brother, we don't do that in this house. What are you doing? That, that's not our community. And checking bad behavior that way is a great preventative tool. And so I took Berkowitz's model and restructured it to focus on hazing prevention. And so a lot of the work I do on campuses, and I'll be talking about that when I when I am visiting schools during Greek University or during Hazing Week this fall on behalf of Greek University, it's really that deep conversation into how do you check this behavior, uh, role play, engagement, encouraging and challenging chapters to talk about this during their chapter meetings, like actually putting it on an agenda and having a functional conversation about hazing and what does it mean versus what it does. Because I know a lot of people who are hazed who are horrible sisters and horrible brothers in their organizations. Right. Yep. And I know that we try to stigmatize that you can't be a good sister or brother if you haven't been hazed. But in fact, I know a lot of people who weren't hazed, who work harder for the organization than people who got the hell beat out of them and or beat the hell out of someone. I, listen, I, you know, I had this conversation with our frat brothers and, mm -hmm. and at one convention and I, I had a, I kind of held court with a group of undergrad brothers. And mm -hmm. I said, listen, man, I've, I've been, I've been at the time I had been in almost 30 years. I'm like, listen, I'm almost 30 years in. I'm here to tell mm -hmm. you right now, mm -hmm. all the stuff that you've heard about, you have to go hard and da -da, and you have to earn it. That's great. But let me, th when you cross that line in the hazing, there are no guarantees. Mm -hmm. whatsoever exactly i know people who as we as we say in in the divine night who are going to call paper yeah just outworked everybody yep. in a chapter yep. everybody and pay, their dues. and pay their dues and pay their dues and stayed active for i don't know how long but then you have the ones who said nah nah i was made right and you can't find them mm -hmm. you can't find that's them the say it again and, and and in my world uh, which is the same as yours you, you have these conversations. And, and for me, okay, all right, have, you, have you paid dues? Can you actually vote at a convention? You know, and I was hazed. You know, I, I don't deny that I was hazed. I'm always a little short on details because I don't ever want to come up in a deposition. But right. I was hazed, right? right. And, and, and I'm always honest with people that in undergrad, I haze people. Mm -hmm. And when I go back and look at that, I'm like, oh, my God, what was I yeah. doing? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I tell people that the, the, the story behind why I stopped hazing. And just how, how dumb I was and the, the level of risk I was taking for myself. You know, I was a parent young and I was like, well, oh, I can't, I can't do this. You know, this is stupid. And so I'm giving you that context to say, and really it took an older, wiser fraternity brother to pull me to the side and, 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 and talk to me. His name was Williams Bond, William Bonds. 
And I can't use all the words that, that he used with me on the family podcast, but he did sort of, you know, the, the two greatest conversations I've had with someone to guide me are, are the, the, the lady in my church who guided me up the aisle when it was time to get saved and baptized. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then William Bonds guided me up the aisle about this hazing thing. And I'm saying yeah. that to say, seriously, there's just a lot of respect for him because he helped me look at like life afterward. And so when we have those conversations with undergrad, we have to understand that the schools have to talk about this. And we also have to engage the organizations. I tell every VP I know, Elizabeth Allen, does a lot of research on commitment for presidents and vice presidents. And she and I have done some research together. And, you know, I tell Elizabeth, she's kind of like the, the, the Jay-Z of, of, of the hazing game, right? She, she testified before Congress. She's just done incredible and powerful work. And the, the, the thing that, that we talk about in this commitment stuff that she really does, and it's just been nice to let me write with her a couple of times is VPs and, and, and FSL leaders. We can't just know nationals numbers when there's a crisis right? and we're calling after yeah. the fact, we have to have constant relationship and talk to people. So the other thing preventative, I encourage and demand and write about this in the book as well. And have implemented this on my own campuses that there has to be participation prior to rush or intake from nationals mm-hmm. or an NPAC grad chapter leaders and nationals. So that they're hands on this process. I also think that that universities, like I was at Mercer University, and they required every person who is interested in FSL to come to the session on hazing prevention. I spoke at Langston University. They did the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see those kind of conversations happening where we're, we're just putting the education in a little bit earlier and a little bit sooner. But I think it has to start with orientation. There has to be engagement. And then the peer and behavioral intervention is a key part, teaching the Greeks how to check each other. And what you see with the Greeks yeah. after I speak invariably, I was at Northern Illinois and we were doing sessions with the Greeks and uh, they had me not only do the, the big hazing prevention session, but we also did one on one sessions with every chapter council. And I know sometimes IFC does get a bad rap because because they, they have some stuff. But I'm going to tell you, it was their IFC who came to me and said, hey, w- we need you back to have this conversation in our chapters. Mm hmm. But what I also loved is that the advisors were present with the undergrads when we were having those conversations. The multicultural Greeks often we, 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 we sort of leave multicultural groups out in the cold. And I think that's another key part of prevention, because I was at uh, when I was in California and my dean of students, uh, she's a VP now, Ebony Ford Turnbow. So Dr. Ford Turnbow, she was my dean of students there. So we get invited to the LTA uh, Lambda Theta Alpha sorority uh, pro, what do they call it? New member introduction. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, oh, they're they're gonna come out and do this thing. So I, I should have saw something, caught something when 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 the flag was what what whatever year they were founded. You know, like the start time was like seven twelve or seven oh nine, something like that. And I should have caught something then, right? So we come in here, and they come oh. in marching. Yeah. They, they did evict us so well, I spit it with them in my head. Right? I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And so we also have to be cautious with, with, with how we include our multicultural Greeks in education, too, because there's this assumption that, oh, they're young, they don't have a history. But multicultural Greeks actually do have a, a rich history and a rich support system. But sometimes if you're a multicultural group and you're way out in Montana and you're all by yourself, you just may not have anyone close. So it's really incumbent upon the universities to keep them in. And then the last thing, and I know I've talked a lot on this, is the way we support our FSL leaders. Because there's no one set up for failure on a campus more than a person who is maybe 24 years old, 25, just got out of grad school. They were maybe in an FSL chapter, maybe had a grad assistantship somewhere. And then we throw them in this job on campus and we say, hey, you're now responsible for uh, 28 chapters with 3000 people. You've got to manage all the councils. You've got to keep up with the programming, the volunteer service, the philanthropy, all the paperwork, every party, every event. Make sure the houses are managed. And by the way, you have to manage hazing. Where is that? How is that working? 
I, I actually just saw this at a university. I just saw it. And, and I was, I was talking to the advisor and then afterwards I just walked I <laughs> after I finished talking to him, I just shook my head and went, he is so overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. He and is we burned so, him out. And I felt horrible for him. Horrible. And I was sitting there thinking he's going to get burned out. The views expressed on Ethocast do not necessarily reflect the views of the hosts, guests, or any entities with which this podcast's participants are affiliated. Questions, comments, email eddie at eddiefrancis.com. You're listening to Ethocast. I'm Eddie Francis. We're talking to Dr. Jason Merriweather and Hazel Prevention Week is upon us September 23rd to 27th. So, I wanted to find out a long time ago, I talked to a couple of psychologists who are both Greek and Mm -hmm. I wanted to find out from them what their thoughts were about what goes through the mind of somebody who is going to commit an act of hazing Mm -hmm. to you. What are some of the indicators that people might be able to catch? Well, this is really a timely question. And, you know, when you kind of gave me some ideas of what we're going to talk about, I was excited about this question. So Emily, Dr. Emily Perlow Mm -hmm. and Dr. Brian Joyce are conducting top notch research on motivation for hazing. And and, and they acknowledge they're standing on the shoulders of, of some other folks. But the research that they're conducting is really, really powerful. And I had an opportunity. We have a a chapter that we wrote together that'll come out, I think, later this fall. Um, And they're doing this research on this sort of situational strength. And it really looks in 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 Dr. Emily Perlow is she's like the, the 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 real big boss when it comes to work on situational strength. And if you look at what she's doing, what's really fascinating to me is that. It's preparing students to engage in that space, in the moment, when if if you can right here in this moment combat some of the other elements that are in front of you. And it's really a first cousin to peer and behavioral intervention. But but really understanding the motivations allows you to leverage this modeling concept of situational strength. So I I think I think it's just great groundbreaking research. And I think we're going to see more and more of that context. And so as you look at what's happening in the world of of, of hazing prevention and motivation, right now, there are a few things that are out there. One, it's it's sense of belonging and looking for sense of belonging. Now, oftentimes that is perceived as, oh, I just am doing this so that I can fit in the organization. But in point of fact, what's often happening is that sense of belonging is also in the perpetuation of hazing because I go along to get along. Yep. So I think that's a key factor that we've got to dig into. Um, There's there's a lot of elements of of meeting needs and the the, the sense of if I fit in, I may not have a social group or, or I believe that if I just go through this to get in the organization, there are going to be so many benefits and so many things that are big for me and good for me if I get in, or I'm just afraid. Uh, There was a case, and I talk about this, and I think it was at Eastern Washington University, where there were like 18 people being hazed. And one of the the victims, I want to read this to you, one of the victims of the hazing, when they asked, why did you go through this? And the victim said, essentially, I thought everyone that was in this w- was with it. And yeah. I didn't want to report because I thought everyone else w- was just with it. I think that was Eastern Washington. And um, with that quote, I had it pulled up. But it's gotten away from me. But he said that. And then another one is in uh, FAMU. And this was the mm-hmm. case with Cap Alpha Psi a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And this is one where Michael Morton, who was 23, a grown man, and um, uh, they were he and Jason Harris, who's 25, another grown man, were hazing Marcus Jones, who was, who was 19 or 20 years old, to become a Kappa. And the judge gave them two years at the time. And this is what she said. This is the circuit court judge. She said the rationale behind imposing the two year sentence on both members was I want to save the victims who will quietly go along because they want to belong. 
Mm -hmm. So I think sense of belonging is a key part. Um, there's tons of other research in here. Uh, the, the, the people who are far greater experts in motivation than me are, are, are talking about. But if you look at sort of that context and that, that definition of motivation, I think the other key part of this that I want to make sure we touch on beyond sense of belonging is this idea of tradition and rite of passage. Yep. That I've got to carry this tradition yeah. and this rite of passage on within my organization. And that is pretty wild. Yeah. That, that, that yeah. folks feel they have to carry that on no matter what, because I think that makes meaning for me as a human. Yeah. Um, I think I'm protecting the organization. And so, again, th there are scholars who are far better than me in the area of motivation. I definitely encourage you to, 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 to read anyone to read Emily Perlow's stuff. But I'm saying that to say that as we build that out, I find that when I dig into cases, because what I do is I use case law. And, and my kind of nerd space in here is I use case law and sort of reverse engineer them. And I look for that moment where someone says, you know, this is really a bad idea. Yeah. It, for example, in the in in my book came out in March of 2020, like two days before the world shut down for the for the pandemic. And when that happened, what was really interesting is, you know, the book had been at the publishers since like October. So in January, news broke of a case in New Mexico, in New Mexico State, and it was involving Kappa Sigma. And uh, Jonathan Silas, Silas had been shot, S-H-O-T, literally shot with a gun by Miguel Altamirano, who I think was a chapter, he was out of the Pledge of Deans or the chapter president or something like that. And the crazy thing about this case is he brought like a loaded nine millimeter, he brought a loaded nine millimeter into a pledge set. And they were doing this thing like this chapter loyalty oath. It has nothing to do with Kappa Sigma. It has nothing to do with what they're actually doing, right? It has nothing to do with anything in the organization, any principles. This is a local thing they were doing. And this loyalty oath that they were doing for Kappa Sigma. So I see this. So I call the publisher like, hey, I got to open the book back up. I got to put this in the book. And they're like, oh, you can't do that. It'll be late. Oh, we're going to have to figure something out because I can't have this happen and write a book about hazing and this not be in the yeah, book. Yeah. Look, it had to go in the book. So I'm giving you that context to say that as we sort of dig into this thing, I opened the book back up, we put it in there. And in my presentation, there's literally a picture of Jonathan Silas in a hospital bed. And it's in every presentation that I do. But you're telling me someone didn't stop and say, bruh, why do you have a loaded gun? And why do you right. have a gun at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, let's let's not even worry about why are we hazing and why are we doing this. But even if we are doing it, which we shouldn't be, why do you have a gun? Yeah. And you're telling me not one person checked him. And even if someone did check him, mm. what was going on that we didn't stop? Yeah. That that nobody could stop what was happening. And yeah. so I think that is what's really frustrating in the world of hazing prevention. You know, Lawrence Ross, our frat brother, he wrote The Divide Nine. And in my 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 the the Burgundy book, the hazing, the, the dismantling hazing book, he talked specifically about engaging in PAC. And and you know, Larry, you you know, he's him. He he came through Berkeley, old school brother. He is who he is. And he has really tough conversations about how we engage in PAC and how we keep advisors involved. You know, um, I think that we got to think about that. Walter Kimbrough, he talks about how university presidents need to be involved mm, in the, mm. to, to go to AFA and to go to AFLV. Why do these things matter? Because these are the people who are dealing with the fallout and the care. Well, they need to also understand where students are and what they're thinking, and what the losses mm -hmm. are, because no one should be caught by surprise. Right. Like, seriously, nothing surprises. If it's high school, if it's athletics, there's nothing that surprises me anymore. When yeah. you have people with 0.48 blood alcohol content levels and um, you have people with 0.51 blood alcohol content levels, we are still not familiar and aware enough about motivations. We're still not familiar and aware enough about just the context of what's happening in these organizations. And so I go back to that moment in, in my research of these cases that have gone to court and I use that legal precedent to frame how schools should train people. 
Where am I going with all that? Essentially, somebody has to have the moment, frat, where we say, this is a bad idea. So that goes right back to the peer intervention. So my tool, tying this back to the motivation question, my tool to engage this is to prepare members to simply check other behaviors Mm -hmm. and then hope someone else stands up and say, you know what? This is right. This is not who we are. This isn't what we should be doing. And hopefully we can change behaviors that way. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question. I'm going to preface it by mentioning that I'm going to tease out the, this interview that I did years and years ago, the one I mentioned with two psychologists. I'm actually going to run that back on Ethocast. And I think I did this interview. Oh my goodness. It's got to be 12 years ago at this point, or maybe uh, you know, thir- 11. And one of them, um, a frat brother of ours by the name of uh, Von Eaglin, who is now Dr. Von Eaglin, he mm-hmm. said something so interesting about what gets into the mind of somebody who is going to commit hazing. And he said, mm-hmm. you know, what these students often struggle with, and he, he specializes in male aggressive behaviors. And mm-hmm. He says what these students often struggle with when they are in the moment Mm -hmm. is they wrestle with these feelings of guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. Um, And he said, and and I always quote Vaughn on this. He said, uh, guilt says, I'm sorry for what I did. Shame says, I'm sorry for who I am. That's real. And, And so with that being said, on a peer to peer basis, you are talking to a student right now and mm-hmm. the student says, I really don't want any trouble in the chapter. I want our chapter to do really well. But this student says, I think I have a couple of troublemakers, though. Mm-hmm. How can that student not feel a sense of shame or guilt so that they can have that tough conversation with a chapter member where they say, no, we're going to do this the right way. We don't have to touch anybody. We don't have to make anybody do anything silly. You know, let's do this the right way and bring them in the right way. Fraternity or sorority, it doesn't matter. What is that conversation with that student look like? Oh, man, that's that's a fun one. And I, I did, while you were asking the question, take a cheat code. And I want to make sure that I, I, I want to tie it into something that Greg Parks wrote about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, also, I uh, think oh, yeah, I uh, had him on the uh, podcast earlier. Yeah. 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 So Parks and also I, I think McCreary dug into this. And so did McCready. Dominance orientation, moral disengagement and low empathy. Yeah. Yep. You've got to understand those three contexts and how they frame. The the environment. To which the question being asked by the subject in, in that the you're posing, it stifles the asking of the question. Mm. So even before we get into a point of the question not being asked, we have to look at that concept, especially dominance orientation. Because what I heard in your question, which is what triggered me to, to, to pull pull it up, I didn't want to get, you know, Dr. Parks is a smart brother. I didn't want to get his stuff wrong. So with that context, If you look at what's happening with this idea of a sort of dominance orientation, well, you're trained. It's almost Pavlovian. You're trained to not even question the system, right? So when the person asks the question, my response, because I have been asked this, I'm pulled to the side after every other university I visit where someone talks to me and says, what do I do? Well, there are a couple of things. I'll talk about this, too. There are the tools the, the real specific tools of how do you deal with the hand in hand when someone begins to attack you, particularly with men question your masculinity and sororities question your loyalty or your womanhood. All of those things happen. Right. And so the, the, the tools to just say, OK, in the face of that, how do you keep going? So I'll talk about that first. And then I ask a few more questions about like, OK, now in the face of Are you going to get hit with these things? Okay, you are. You know you are. Well, let's talk about how do you stand to it? How do you do this long enough for someone to join you? And then B, what happens if no one joins you? Do you want your chapter to exist? Because what I do in these presentations is sort of like when Jay-Z says, don't be the next contestant on my summer jam screen. I tell schools, I've been here. And if I leave here and you have a hazing incident, I will put you in my next PowerPoint. Then the next thing is, who's the alum that you can trust to help you? 
Mm, mm, mm-hmm. that has a little bit of authority, a little bit of age, a little bit of stroke. Who is that alone? So uh, there's a thing I do. I'm going to give a little bit of my presentation away. So when I talk about dealing with alumni, I have learned that the biggest perpetuators of the que- the issues that led to the question that you ask are far more often alumni than I think any of us will believe. It's, it's like my, my next book is on hazing and athletics. That'll be out in the spring. I'm also concurrently doing a deep dive research project into how alumni are truly factoring into this. This one is going to be a lot of fun. Um, why am I bringing that up? Well, frat, oftentimes you're not just standing up to other students. You're standing up to the 25, 26 year old who, and, and I, and I tell this sort of jokingly and colloquially, but there's a lot of seriousness in it. There's always truth in jest. When I'm talking to students and I say, well, you know, you got that alum that's 25 years old. They don't have a woman. They don't have a girlfriend. They're not married. They don't have a partner. They have nothing. They maybe didn't even graduate. They actually might not be an alum. Right. <laughs> <they're all> right. <laughs> right. Exactly, yeah. Right? That, that, yep. That's another one. And, and that's across organizations. That's not yeah. just MPAC. That Because listen, IFC really gets excited when I talk about that one. But, mm-hmm. and, and so does MPC. So then they may or may not be an alum, but they're older. They might not even have a job. They, they show up on campus with a faded old T-shirt that's a little too tight to <laughs> not afford a new shirt. They cook the best barbecue. They're on the grill. And before you can even speak to a freshman, they're already there. And it's like, why are you in her face? Why are you in his face? What are you doing? And those are the ones whose identities are so solely constructed in the chapter, not even necessarily in the organization, but sometimes the organization, but even worse in the chapter. How do you fight that person? And so we have to talk about the engagement of other alumni. This is why the grad chapters have to be close. This is why nationals and the consultant models that that uh, I, I have seen NPC, NPC use, keeping those folks close because you're going to need help to fight the adults who, yeah, yeah. I you may legally be an adult, but you're still in college. But, but the ones who are out of college with or without degree, how do you fight them? So I go through tools on how to fight the alumni because whenever I bring alumni up, it comes out over and over and over and over again that they are the ones who are fighting to keep this in, even if we want it out. If we decide as a chapter, we want it out, the alumni will roll up on us like, what are you doing to my chapter? Don't you have a job? Right? So I tell that story and and we talk about that and we have fun with it. So I'm just giving you that context to say that those are the things that we're dealing with in, in that engagement. So then once you get past the alumni, who can you trust in the school? Well, then comes the fear of, well, I don't want to be responsible for my chapter getting snatched. Yeah. I I don't want to get other people in trouble. Yeah, but you don't want someone to die. So this idea that I talk about of life versus tradition, because we are now playing with lives. We are now playing with lives. And so I give you that context to say that all of those are tools and conversations that we talk about. And then it can get deeper based on what's happening in the chapter. Um, I was at a school in Georgia, and even though what happened with Max Groover happened at, at LSU, he was from Georgia. So I was at a school in Georgia that wasn't too far from where he grew up. So there were people who knew him. So when I brought him up, you know, they come to me and they're like, I knew him. I went to high school with him. Mm. I don't want that in my chapter. My chapter, I feel like some of those same things are happening. And so that's the kind of stuff that we have to mm. really unpack. And and I think it's also helping folks know you're actually not alone in wanting to save your chapter. Yeah, yeah. How do yeah. we keep you strong? And saving the chapter looks different to some people. Yeah. Saving the chapter means perpetuating the hazing, the harm, and the violence, and the drinking, mm-hmm. which is also violence because people are dying. So it's digging into those elements, but it goes back to how do we fight the very culture that prevents a young student, woman or man, or whoever's in this organization from asking how do I check the bad behavior? Yeah. So it's getting them to be sort of not alone in that process. And that's really, really difficult. But often real time, that's where it goes. 
And if I can convince someone, one time I was at a school, I won't say the state of the location because I don't want you to like trace where I've been and give that school away. But once I had someone talk to me about something that was happening, and it took me an hour to convince them to talk to the dean of students. Mm. And they yeah. wanted to, but they were so afraid of what would happen to them, rightfully so. They were not cowards. They were afraid, like, literally someone might hurt me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that it goes back to that idea of the dominance orientation that happens in sororities and fraternities. Yeah. Dr. Jason Merriweather, he is a speaker, also author of Dismantling Hazing and Greek Letter Organizations, Effective Practices for Prevention, Response, and Campus Engagement. Man, thank you so much for a great conversation. Brother, thank you for having me, uh, Fred. I'm really grateful. As I said in the beginning, you've been doing great work for a long time. I'm really honored to be a part of it. Uh, I wish everyone a lot of great, healthy conversations. They're incredible people doing this. I'm clearly not the only one. I always try to throw shout outs to the researchers and scholars and speakers, and most of all, to honor and acknowledge the parents who are doing this work. But it's just really critical and important to me that no matter who you bring to your campus to work with student athletes, uh, if it's to your high school, if it's working with your band or student orgs, you know, I went to Ohio State and they had all their Greeks, all their student athletes, even the football team and the band all in all in the big room going through. Taking it seriously at that level is huge. And so for me, no matter who your speaker is, although I'm glad to be going the places I'm going, no matter who your speaker is, I think it's really critical that you just follow up with those conversations. You know, don't let this, it's like my pastor used to say growing up in, in Guthrie, Kentucky, Jesus done came and went and you missed the Holy Ghost, right? Don't let a speaker come to your campus, give you all this information, especially if it's a, a family or a parent talking to you, and then they're gone and you go back to business as usual. Take, take the information seriously. If it's this fall, I'm going to be at Jacksonville University, uh, Millersville University, Butnell, spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I think I'm going to Henderson State. I'm going to University of Tennessee at some point. A lot of great stuff happening. If I, if I left you out, my agent will, will get me for that, but I didn't mean to. But, but those are just the places I'm, I'm thinking of because I just looked at my flights recently. But for the places I go, what I try to leave with them, and if you bring me to your campus, what I'll try to leave with you is this any, the same thing that other speakers will, will try to leave as well. And it's really simple. It is use this stuff. Whether you think we're entertaining or not, whether you, we, 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 we trigger your emotions and you're sad or it's, it's really deep for you, use the information we're giving you. If a family's speaking to you, hear the loss. But also, and this is what I do, focus on that moment of, wow, what would I have done if this is my chapter? I could have checked this. And, and that's where I come in with this context of life versus tradition. Yeah, we can keep what's going on in the chapter. That's great. But is it really worth another person dying? In our own fraternity, and I can't do this and not, not get our own fraternity, Eddie, I have to do this. Yeah, yeah. In California... When Tyler Hilliard yeah. was murdered, killed during a Golden Paddle event. What I talk about in, in, in when I frame that case is when Maisha Kimball Hilliard, his mother, confronted our, the guys wearing our letters mm -hmm. in the hospital. She confronted them. Mm -hmm. And you know what they did? They didn't say, yeah, we were hazing them. They didn't say, yeah, we, we knew what we were doing. We did what we did. They lied. Mm. They, they told her, oh, we don't know what happened to him. We were going on a hike and he just passed out. The, 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 that was cowardice. Mm -hmm. yeah. They didn't even have the guts to be honest with the mother in the moment they lied. Think about the case of, of, of Michael Dang, Michael Chun Dang. I think this was at uh, oh, da, 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 upstate New York, upstate New York, Binghamton. I think it was at Binghamton. And th they left him in the Poconos trying to clean up all the evidence. 
I've read many, many times that in, it, for Tim Piazza, instead of just leaving him, had someone just called the police, Tim might still be alive right now. That's the kind of stuff that we have going on, that these people perpetrate this. And then they're not even woman enough or man enough. They don't even have the humanity to not lie about the consequences. To this day, Kristen High and Kanitha Safir, we know there was a settlement. We know that AKA paid a lot of money. But, 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 but from a position, AKA is still not taking ownership. Uh, in, in the, in, in the, the documentary, uh, the hazing documentary, what's crazy is the family still doesn't have answers wow. because the chapter members who were out there on that beach, when those young women drowned, they still don't have closure. And this is Byron Hurt's hazing uh, documentary, which is just incredible, powerful. Omega, Omega Man, incredible, powerful documentary. Watch that, play that. But I'm saying all that to say that everything that's happening, the people who are perpetuating this don't even have the, 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 the will to at least admit that they were wrong in the face of the family. So my question is this, and this is where I leave you. And I know you didn't ask me a question. We're supposed to be wrapping up, but but I, I leave you with this, brother. If you cannot face a mother, a father, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a child, if you can't face them and say, yeah, I was hazing your child. If you can't face them and you're going to cower and lie. This woman met her son's killers in the hospital. And if we don't want to call them killers, then we'll say they're the people who perpetuated the hazing violence that led to his death, if you feel better about that. But she met her son's killers who were wearing our letters, brother. And they couldn't even look her in the face and tell the truth. They lied and still tried to hide it. If you can't even do that, if you can't even tell the truth to a mother who's grieving, watching her son die, you don't need to be hazing. And I'll leave it there. Jason, man, thank you so much for the work you're doing. And honestly, thank you so much for the passion that you have for talking about this. Um, and I, I really appreciate you, man. Thank you for joining me on EthoCast. Thank you, Fred, brother. Glad to be here.